Okay, so you saw what an amazing discovery that was. And uh, the tomb was nearly intact. It looked like there's probably robbers soon after Tut was buried there, but they were stopped and scared off and the tomb was resealed. Um, and as you're going to see when we look at the treasures, uh, it was a pretty remarkable find, especially because Tutankhamun died when he was only 18. He didn't accomplish very much in his life, and that actually explains also some of the tomb as well. So you saw that Howard Carter right, poked a hole through the... Um, the seal and Lord Carnarvon asked him if he could see anything and he said yes wonderful things the first chamber was just cram full of beds covered in gold and two chariots and boxes and all sorts of things because Tut died young his tomb was not ready and they actually had to use another tomb a tomb that was not designed for a pharaoh and it was actually on the small side so things were crammed in there with really hardly any room to spare as a result right so this was that first chamber so you saw them uh, go down into the uh, chamber over here right and they explored around and then there was a another chamber back here and then the burial chamber so these photos show a little bit what it was like as they started to explore and then as they started to re carefully remove the contents over 10 years it took 10 years for howard carter and the team to take all of the objects out catalog them preserve them and send them to the egyptian museum in cairo but you can see the beds here all sorts of different kinds of beds that he was bringing two disassembled chariots that he would have used in uh, war and you can see what they would have looked like once they were fully assembled a uh, throne showing he and his wife who is also his i believe his half sister um, that was not unusual the royal line went through the female line and uh, because the pharaoh was a god they were essentially imitating osiris and isis these are two statues representing the ka of uh, tut and uh, the the burial chamber and you can see this is where uh, Howard Carter covered up the hole that he made in order to explore there uh, early before anyone knew and then covered his tracks they had an official opening uh, of that sealed chamber you can see them breaking through this is Lord Carnarvon there's Howard Carter uh, one of the things that they uh, found immediately was that the uh, wooden shrines covered in gold uh, were crammed into this tiny space in there and there was barely any room to navigate around them right so you can see this burial chamber is very small and the uh, shrines that held the coffin uh, barely fit inside there when they opened up started to open up the shrine they saw that the door was sealed with the necropolis seal of the priests that, and they knew that the contents inside were preserved uh, we'll look at the wall paintings, but you can see the wall paintings of King Tut and a little bit on top of the shrines. These gold covered shrines, uh, there were several of them uh, encompassing the stone sarcophagus. Uh, you can see here's Howard Carter working on taking apart the shrines so they could be removed one by one. Now, <clears throat> in this um, painting you probably recognize who this god is this is osiris and this is king tut embracing osiris but in the next scene it's king tut as osiris because he becomes osiris and the next pharaoh is doing the opening mouth ceremony on his mummy right the, so as these gold shrines were taken apart they revealed a stone sarcophagus on the inside so there was a gold covered shrine with another gold covered shrine another gold covered shrine another gold covered shrine a stone sarcophagus a gold covered wooden sarcophagus another gold covered wooden sarcophagus a solid gold sarcophagus and then the body of king tut with the solid gold death mask right so again remember that he is a minor pharaoh and just look at the sheer amount of treasure uh, as they start opening the coffins here's the 
gold covered wooden coffin they started to uncover you can see here the solid gold uh, coffin it's pretty amazing I've seen the treasures in the Cairo Museum it's pretty amazing to see a coffin uh, that is solid gold filled in with beautiful blue stone and red carnelian it's uh, pretty amazing the sheer amount of gold though is, is incredible so here's the uh, sarcophagus and then the famous gold death mask that was on Tutankhamun's mummy. His mummy bandages were filled with all sorts of protective amulets. And uh, after unwrapping everything, they finally revealed the body of King Tut himself. And that wasn't all because next to the burial chamber was yet a another chamber. This had a anubis kind of portable shrine and behind in this gold covered wooden box were the canopic jars that held the internal organs of king tut right, now um soon after tut's um uh finding uh, lord carnarvon actually cut himself shaving in cairo uh and got blood poisoning and died soon after the burial chamber was opened and newspapers that didn't have access to the story uh, of the of the archaeological expedition. Only one newspaper had exclusive rights to print what was found, and then all the other newspapers had to print it a day later, a couple days later. They came up with a new story after Lord Carnarvon died, and they came up with this idea that there was a curse on King Tut. And so anyone remotely connected to the dig who uh, had any sort of strange things happen to them or died from anything, it was all chalked up to the curse story, uh, which was just basically fabricated. But um, this excavation also... Uh, inspired a whole new crop of mummy movies. So the most famous one after this, after the finding of King Tut was only 11 years after Tut was discovered. Boris Karloff played the mummy, you can see here. So after the excavation of Tut's tomb, uh, many people thought there would, there would be nothing left to find the Valley of the Kings, but that, of course, was wrong. The more exploration they did, the more they found, nothing quite like King Tut in terms of preservation. But uh, in 1995, they found a very large tomb complex for the sons of Ramses II by his uh, many wives. They also found uh, something called KV-63. All the finds in the Valley of the Kings get a KV number, King's Valley, and then basically... Uh, just a, a random number assigned to it, but this turned out to be a mummification chamber where uh, mummies were prepared. Okay, we're going to do a little bit of a tour through Egyptian history now, and we're going to, you know, sort of look at the overall trends, but uh, you won't have to get too focused on all the different pharaohs. We'll mention a few. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll pay attention to maybe a couple that are, are f more familiar to many people, right? But when we look at Egyptian history, it's like the history we've seen in Mesopotamia and other p places where there's an overall trajectory from small, civil small societies to larger societies, less complex to more complex, right? So in Mesopotamia, we went from chiefdoms to one state to many city-states and then to an empire. In Egypt we have a similar kind of process starting with the Old Kingdom. Right? The Old Kingdom collapses. We'll talk a little bit about its collapse. That's something that we'll also discuss the last week of class. But the Old Kingdom collapses and when these kingdoms face a collapse uh, Egyptologists refer to the periods of kind of weakness and disunity as intermediate periods until the next rise of Egyptian culture. So the next one was the Middle Kingdom. Uh, they faced a collapse that we'll look at. That's the second intermediate period. And then there's the New Kingdom. Right? Okay, when we look at the Old Kingdom, right, th there wasn't a lot of internal warfare um, in 
the in the old kingdom because this was one unified state as opposed to Mesopotamia. Uh, there were peoples that they had to fight around them, but not too many. And if you had to predict who, um, you know, who would have uh, developed the greater military technology, Egypt or Mesopotamia, you probably would predict Mesopotamia because all the constant warfare led to new innovations in war and weapons. And with the Egyptians, there wasn't that need. So they got by for quite a while with an army that looked like this. Um, you know, no helmets, no armor, soldiers with spears and shields. While in Mesopotamia, and also in Syria and the Levant here, they were developing uh, new bows, the horse-drawn chariot, bronze armor, all sorts of new weapons. Um, and you could probably figure out what eventually happened. That wasn't until later though. The Old Kingdom collapses around the same time as the Akkadian Empire, a little bit after the Akkadian Empire. About the Middle Kingdom, well, in the Middle Kingdom, again, uh, this was, you know, around 1700 BC, the Egyptians had got by with this kind of military technology. While in, um, in this part, Mesopotamia and Syria and the Levant, uh, people got very good with all new kinds of weapons. And you could predict what might have happened. What happened is that a group from this area came in and invaded the northern part of Egypt and conquered that area and ruled over that area for a couple hundred years. These people were known as the Hyksos. Hyksos uh, basically is an Egyptian, I think it's a Greek term that's borrowed from Egyptian that means shepherd kings or foreign rulers. Right? To the Egyptians, the Hyksos were foreigners. Where they were uh, foreigners who came in and conquered the northern part of Egypt. So you can be pretty sure that the Egyptians were going to do all they could to kick out the Hyksos. And that's exactly what happened. And in fact, one pharaoh you can see here on this mummy died fighting the Hyksos. These severe gash wounds to his mummy uh, were probably in, inflicted in battle. Right. But then to prevent this from happening again, the Egyptians had to come up with a plan, right? That is, if you have these strong city-states here in Canaan that could launch raids into Egypt, what do you do? I've asked this question to many classes, and sometimes people say, well, what about the Egyptians building a wall across their frontier? Um, and that might have worked. That would take quite an effort to build a wall. Um, but it, it, it might have worked to keep people out, but um, it would still allow people to get pretty close to the heartland of Egypt. Are there any other things that the Egyptians could have done? What they decided to do was to actually invade this area and make it part of a new Egyptian empire. So the new kingdom after that second intermediate period is a period of Egyptian empire. This is the period of King Tut and Ramses II who we'll look at. What the Egyptians did was to weaken all of these city-states here and make sure that they were not strong enough to invade Egypt and also rule over the territory with Egyptian governors. They also invaded uh, parts to the south where the Nubian uh, civilization was, which we'll, we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. Right? So they created an empire. And as they were creating their empire, another empire was growing, and that was the hip empire of the Hittites. And you could kind of predict what happened. These two empires went to war. And where did they go to war? Right here where the two empires met at a battle uh, near a city called Kadesh. Okay, well, let's take a look at some major pharaohs of the New Kingdom. We won't go into too much detail, but give you a little idea of the New Kingdom, the period of empire of ancient Egypt. Hatshepsut is a very interesting pharaoh because this pharaoh was a woman. And after her husband, who was pharaoh, died, uh, rather than serving as a regent and having the young son 
crowned Pharaoh, she decided to be crowned Pharaoh and wore all the symbols of power, including the, the pharaonic beard, uh, built a number of temples in Egypt. Uh, and then when she died, her stepson became Pharaoh, Tutmos III. Tutmos III is known to many Egyptologists as uh, the Napoleon of ancient Egypt because he was a brilliant general. He ended up uh, fighting a major battle at a city in ancient Canaan called Megiddo. Mound of Megiddo is Har Megiddo, which is where we get our term Armageddon. Um, after him, another famous pharaoh that ruled was Akhenaten. You can see Akhenaten over here and his wife. This is a, the, a very famous piece of Egyptian art. This is the bust of Nefertiti, the wife of Akhenaten. Akhenaten is sometimes called the heretic pharaoh because he changed the Egyptian religion during his reign. It was changed quickly back after his death uh, because it upset the status quo of, of, of Egypt. But he focused worship on this a sun god called Aten and here you can see th and his which is why Aten is part of his name and you can see the solar rays with the Ankh symbol which means life shining down on Nefertiti Akhenaten and their children right and you can see him worshiping Aten here uh, the priests of the traditional gods like Amun were not happy at all with this change so his son, who became Pharaoh, was Tutankhaten, long life to Aten. And he changed his name to Tutankhamun, long life to Amun, to sh symbolize that the religion had changed back to the way it was before. All right? So Tutankhamun did not uh, live a very long time. He did not get to do much during his reign, uh, but he's known today because of his uh, his tomb. Okay, after Tutankhamun and probably the height of the Egyptian Empire was under Ramses II, uh, who I'm sure many of you have heard of the name Ramses. Uh, Ramses went to war against the Hittite Empire when the Hittites took a city called Kadesh. He marched his army up from Egypt uh, all the way, you can see, to that frontier to fight the Hittite army. When he uh, marched out right, and set up camp, uh, the rest of his army was making their way up. Right? So the army was kind of staggered. Uh, the Egyptian army met two Bedouin. The Bedouin said that the Hittite army had actually retreated because they were so scared to hear that the Egyptians were coming. So Ramses and the Egyptians kind of relaxed a little bit. Uh, and then the Egyptians found two Hittite spies. And you can see here they're beating them. And what they learned from the spies is that actually the Hittite army didn't retreat. They were waiting behind the city of Kadesh to launch an attack on Ramses. And at pretty much that moment, the Hittite army launches an attack, runs right through the camp of Ramses, and it looks like Ramses and the Egyptian army is going to be defeated. But what happened is that ancient soldiers were usually paid in what they could loot. When the Hittites felt like they were winning, a lot of the soldiers started to loot the dead bodies of the Egyptian soldiers. This allowed Ramses to launch a counterattack. So he was able to uh, destroy many of the Hittite chariots. And the end result was actually a draw. The battle turned into a draw. Neither the Hittites nor the Egyptians could really claim uh, at that point a victory over each other in terms of that battle. But that, of course, didn't stop Ramses from bragging that he won right? and usually showing himself on the tombs, you know, in his chariots, you know, marching over the Hittites, as you can see here. Um, so even though he bragged about this battle, which was fought early in his reign, um, the main importance of the battle was that these two empires signed a peace treaty and ushered in about 
uh, 60 years of peace between these two empires. And that is really the, the lasting effect of the battle during Ramsey's reign. Uh, two copies of this peace treaty, uh, one was found in, in Egypt, one was found in the Hittite capital. There's actually a replica of the treaty in the Uni United Nations building. Uh, and it says first peace treaty in history, which is uh, pretty much correct. And Ramses married a Hittite princess and cemented good relations between the two empires. And then for the remainder of Ramses' reign, he still had something like 60 years, he went on a massive building project, building temples uh, where uh, he showed his military exploits. One of his most famous uh, buildings, well, here's, here's one I should show you first. This is a, a, another uh, temple at Luxor, but one of his most famous constructions is Abu Simbel in the very southern part of Egypt. And what is shown here is four statues of Ramses, right, as, as Horus, as, you know, as a living god. Um, and inside are wall paintings showing his defeat of the Hittites. And then at this very back chamber are seated four gods. There's the god Ta, the god Amun, Ramses, and Ra. And on one day of the year, the day when Ramses ascended the throne, was crowned Pharaoh of, of Egypt, the sun shines down the entryway and it lights up the gods in the back chamber. And that was deliberate. They deliberately constructed the temple so that the sun would light up those figures on that specific day. And Ramses died at a ripe old age, probably in his 80s or, or early 90s. And just like Pepe II, um, it actually was a weak point after Ramses. So it's actually not such a great thing to have one ruler ruling for an extremely long time. Um, but he's probably one of the most pharaohs in Egyptian history, famous for his building projects and famous for that significant battle against the Hittite Empire. Obviously, it, Egyptian history continues long after this, up until the, you know, the period of, of the Roman Empire, right? So for at least another um, thousand years at this point, Right. Um, and so from, you know, f from about 3100 BC to about 30 BC. So for really over 3000 years, you have an unbroken chain of Egyptian culture, history, language, right? Obviously there are changes throughout that time, but you have a real consistency in the history. And it's quite amazing to think uh, th about that history over such a long period of time. Okay, so this is what will conclude this week's material, Mesopotamia and Egypt. Uh, next week, we're going to start with the ancient civilizations of India, and we will also uh, take start to take a look at um, Central America and South America. Have a good rest of your